to the Sunday morning services of the Jupiter Road Baptist Church. The church is conveniently located at 2422 North Jupiter Road, Garland, Texas. We know you'll enjoy the services, so remain with us for some good singing and an outstanding message from God's Word by Dr. James Starks.
souls have tested him throughout the course of time. So many still reach out to him with broken hearts and minds. And every one of them will say, without exception, that they find Jesus never. Thank you, Tom and Teresa. They're two of my favorite singers. I always feel like shouting when I hear them sing. Heard about the old farmer and his wife went to the county fair for the first time, and while they were there, they saw an airplane, and they talked to the pilot about taking them up. He said, $25, Mr. Farmer, you and your wife to go up. The old farmer said, I made a bad crop. I don't have much money. Well, he said, I'll tell you, I'll take you up. Anyway, if you do not holler, but now while we're up in the air, if you holler, you're going to have to pay me the $25. They got up real high, and the old pilot just flipped around three, four times and turned over the plane and made all kinds of flips, and then when he got back on the ground, he said, Mr. Farmer, you did it. You didn't holler at all. The old farmer said, I almost hollered once when my wife fell out. <laughs> well, <coughs> Tom and Teresa almost hollered. I'll tell you, when I hear you sing, I want to holler. I want to shout. I'm thrilled to be here today. I've been, I've preached here several times for your pastor. I was pastor of the First Baptist Church of Garland 28 years. I remember the day when he started this church out here with nothing. God led him. Isn't it wonderful how he has led this great church to be such a lighthouse for our Lord? I'm thrilled to be here on Father's Day, and I want all the fathers to lift the hand, please. Every father lift his hand with me. Thank you. Thank you. I see Dr. Bob Sewell here, Assistant Superintendent of Schools, and he was, many of you knew him when he was 
principal and head of the South Garland High School. Now he's been promoted assistant superintendent. Brother Bob, stand up. Thank you. He's one of the finest friends I have. I borrow all my money from him. <laughs> he, <laughs> he's going with me and his wife in a few days, Jim Toller and his wife, two of the, another two of the greatest friends I've ever had. Pastor and his wife and many others are going to Europe to see the Passion Play over at Oberammergau, Germany, Austria and Switzerland. We're going to have a great time and you pray for us. When I thought about Father's Day, I thought about the church. Father loves the church. Amen. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I the son of man am? They answered and said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Others say, Elijah, and then others say, Thou art Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. Jesus saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter, always being the spokesman for the twelve, answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. And Jesus answered, and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. Ephesians 5.25, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Acts 20, 28, feed the church which he hath purchased with his own precious blood. My subject today is loving the church, loving the church. And I want you to people to know this is a brand new sermon. Amen. I've been preparing it especially for you this week. Loving the church. Some of the most precious words in all of the Bible are the words when Jesus was talking and speaking and magnifying his church. During the ministry of our Lord, he particularized his church when he said, took his disciples up to Mount Hermon, near the coast of Caesarea Philippi. In just a few days, he would soon be going to the cross of Calvary. Before he ascended that hill, he wanted to know what they thought of him. And he asked them this question, but whom say ye that I am? They answered and said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, some Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. But he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? I want to know what you think of me. And then Simon, being the spokesman, said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now that word rock <clears throat> is a metaphor. Jesus often used metaphors. He said, I am the door. Well, he's not a door like that, but he is the door to eternal life. Amen. But Jesus said, on this rock, this metaphor I'm talking about, this 
Petra. In the Greek, it means great, huge rock, a mighty fortress. And Paul vouchsafed this when he said, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And the Old Testament talked about in the Psalms, The Lord is my rock and my fortress. Amen. But Jesus said, Thou art Peter. Now that word, Simon Peter, meant Petros. The word Petros means a little teeny weeny rock. And I'm a very teeny weeny rock. Every Christian is a little rock. But Jesus is the mighty rock. Amen. He is the Petra, not the Petros. And some denominations have missed very far by building upon Simon Peter, who is a little teeny weeny rock, instead of Jesus, the mighty rock, Amen. the Petra. And the ecclesia in the Greek, he's talking about ecclesia, the church of the living God. It is built upon the mighty, huge rock. Amen. And Jesus is saying to us today, I am that rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. That word gate means power. It means strength, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against Christ's church. Amen. Now the church will always be imperishable. The church is built upon the indestructibility of Jesus Christ. Amen. No organization in the world has been persecuted like the church of the living God. It is being persecuted this present day. It was persecuted when Domitian, the early ruler, sought to exterminate the church. And then Nero said, I'll do away with the church. I'll exterminate it. But the church grew mightily while Nero and Domitian were rulers over the Roman Empire. Then Hitler came on the scene. And you remember Hitler said, I will do away with the church. I will persecute the church. I will exterminate the church of the living God. Right after World War II, when our soldiers came home, we had won the war. I remember going to Fort Worth, and I heard Martin Neumiller, that great Lutheran preacher of Germany. He had the largest church, the largest cathedral in all of Germany. Now he was thin and emaciated. I heard him stand there in Will Rogers' auditorium and preached to a mighty audience. And I heard him say, my cathedral was full of people. And Hitler said his Gestapo. I looked and here they were, standing all around. And I looked and I said, I'm going to magnify Christ today as I always do. And when he had finished, they said to him, if you preach one more sermon and magnify Christ as you've done today, you're going to prison. That meant death, more than likely. But that very next Lord's Day, 
Martin Neil Miller told us. I stood there in that beautiful cathedral, that magnificent church. I saw the Gestapo everywhere. And I stood and lifted my voice and I said, Jesus is my only Fuhrer. Amen. Hitler is not my Fuhrer. Jesus is my Fuhrer. Amen. And after the service, they came and got him. Gestapo carried him to prison. He stayed there all during the war. Now Hitler would have taken his life as he did seven million people, but he was afraid. So many Lutherans, and so many Baptists and Presbyterians knew that he was a man of God, and Hitler was afraid to take his life. Now, Martin Neil Miller loved the church, and after the war, he said, the church marches triumphantly and victoriously on. And he said, I love the church. Amen. I love Jesus. And no one today is able to hurt the church of the living God. Now I come to the question, why are we to love the church, the ecclesia. Why are we to really love and treasure the church of Jesus Christ? Well, the first great reason was because Jesus established it. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Amen. And he said, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Amen. It means this morning that he purchased it with his own blood. He gave his body. He gave his all for the church of Jesus Christ. Many people are greatly mixed up about the beginning of the church of the living God. Jesus said it very plainly upon this rock I will build my church Amen. we had no English then but in the Greek it meant I am building my church now Amen. he began building it in the embryonic form when he said to his disciples come and follow me Amen. he was building his church when he said, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree and follow me. Jesus had begun his church and it was functioning on the day of Pentecost. Amen. For they added to the church. Now we're to love the church because Jesus loved it and gave himself for it. Now it is not built upon the physical and upon the human instrumentalities of life. But he takes the small rocks like you and like me and these little Petros. He builds his great ecclesia, his mighty church that marches triumphantly on. Amen. And then we're to love the church because it is a doctrinal institution. Amen. What is doctrine? 48 times, I counted here in New Testament, 48 times the word doctrine is in the New Testament. It means that which Christ taught. Amen. That's all it means. It means what the Bible teaches. That is doctrine. And beloved, we have nothing else to preach but the doctrine of Almighty God. Amen. It's the doctrine of salvation. We're saved by grace. It is a doctrine of heaven. The saved will one day be with Jesus in that celestial city not made with hands. It is the doctrine of hell. And the Bible teaches that those who do not accept Christ 
go to a burning eternal hell with the devil and his angels to live forever and evermore. Now, the church is a doctrinal institution because it rests on the Bible. Amen. You ask me what the church believes, I hand you the Bible. Amen. We believe every word of that Bible. Amen. That's what we believe. Amen. One day when I was in the seminary, a little girl came up to the librarian and said, would you give me a catechism and the doctrine of the Baptist church? And the librarian reached under and found the Bible and gave it to her said that's our doctrine right there that's all we have beloved we don't need anything else Amen. we only need the Bible Amen. that's our doctrine Amen. and the church must teach these doctrines till Jesus comes Amen. and thirdly we're to love the church because it is a missionary institution Amen. the primary work of the church is to glorify God and to carry that glory and that message around the world. He said, as my Father sent me, even so send I you. But go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want you to go. Amen. You're to begin right here in Garland, in Richardson, in Dallas, and then in Texas, and then into all of the world, you're to carry the message. Our mandate is, go and carry the message of Jesus Christ. Christians are to reproduce. Amen. They are to carry the message. And if uh, you're a Christian, you're to make, help make others to be Christians. Amen. And we're to do our very best. I'm glad this church magnifies missions. Almost every time I have been here, I have met missionaries that have come home that are paid by this church. But I want to say fourthly, we're to love the church because it is a sacrificing institution. Amen. Our Lord set the example. He came from the portals of heaven. Paul put it in this phraseology. He was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. He came down and lived a humble life to be persecuted. He was persecuted all during his ministry. They called him a wine-bibber. They called him a thief. They called him every name. And they whipped him and scourged him and put the crown of thorns on him. And they nailed him to the cross. And they wagged their heads and said, He saved others! Himself he cannot save. And Jesus knew what it was to go through persecution Amen. and sacrifice for the church of the living God. The Bible is very plain in saying Christ loved the church and gave his life for the church. Amen. It means he sacrificed for the church. Now, the early church sacrificed and you notice Stephen, the first deacon, oh, how he sacrificed, and they stoned him to death. But his face did shine like that of an angel. And then as he was dying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Amen. Oh, he died like a Christian. And look at Paul, out on the Appian Way. They cut his head off. They persecuted him, put him in prison many times and Paul knew how, what it was to suffer for Christ and his sake. I was in Russia a few years ago and I remember having a very prominent place sitting right up there to my right in the balcony 
and over 300 people were in attendance that night. And I heard the story of this church. People come there three hours ahead of time trying to get a seat in that church and more than a thousand on the outside trying to get in. But if you're a visitor from out of the country, they usher you in and save seats for you as it did for us. I sat there. I heard the story. During the winter when the snow was three feet deep, and it was 20 degrees below zero in that same church, the pastor said, everybody put on his coats. We're going to raise the windows. They put their coats on and the windows were raised. And as they raised the windows, more than a thousand people been standing in snow more than an hour waiting to worship and to sing and to hear the sermon, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as they put their heads in, and many of them had to stand back, their feet deep in snow, and 20 feet, and 20 degrees below zero. They worshiped, and they cried, and they praised God. And when I heard that, I said, we do not sacrifice down in Texas. We have not learned to sacrifice if needs be. Oh, my dear people, we ought to be willing to die for the church. We ought to be willing to die for the church because of what the church is. What is the church? The church is his ecclesia, his called out, his saved, his redeemed. And what is the church? It says it is his body, Amen. the body of Jesus Christ. You cannot disassociate the body from Charles Cockrell. You cannot disassociate Jesus from his body. Amen. That is his body.